Well, good evening. We're so excited that you have decided to join us. And welcome to YMTF Live, How You Play the Game, The Rules of Engagement. Now, the objective of this session is we're going to have open dialogue centered around the assimilation into the corporate culture, managing up, knowing what to do, or knowing, I'm sorry, knowing what you don't know, and the unwritten rules of corporate America. And we have our panelists here, and I'm going to invite each one of them to say a little something about themselves, and we'll start with Mr. Blakely. Good evening, uh, my name is Kevin Blakely. Here with the YMTF program. I believe this is my 12th or 13th year uh, with the program. Uh, I work for at and in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I'm a native of Pine Bluff, though. A uh, member of Cal Alpha Psi fraternity, and glad to be back. You don't want to give him a mic, a little karaoke. <laughs> my name is Kamel Hodges. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion and Equal Opportunity University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Uh, my first experience with U, uh, UAPB was probably back in 2005 when we were coming here with the Lois Bowers and the Keller Company. Uh, and I have been working with Career Services and I have have a fondness for this university and although I remember Ms. Jones told me I could go to one of those other schools, I still love UAPB. I am a member also of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Good evening. Uh, Barry Henry is my name. Uh, 15 years Pine Bluff Arsenal. Uh, 15 years Rock Island Arsenal. Uh, local pastor here, uh, 12 years. 1982 UAPB graduate. Uh, played football here from 82, 3 to 4. Member of Omega Sapphire Fraternity. Uh, platinum member of UAPB. Alumni. Life member of the uh, NAACP. First year actively participating in the panel discussion, but I've always participated in the programs. Invited to be a part of the uh, panel this year. Pleased to be here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carla Carter. This is actually my third year in YMTF. I work in Houston, originally from Chicago, Illinois, as a client relations specialist for a information technology company. And I'm just, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to hopefully enlighten some of you guys and share some of my experiences and um, just share. Thank you, panelists. Uh, again, I am Felisa Kennedy, a proud 1990 graduate of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, and I will serve as a facilitator for this session. Um, I believe that we'll approach it this way. I have questions uh, that I will ask the panelists and I will engage the audience maybe with piggybacking questions as I deem appropriate. So we'll follow that uh, and we'll get through this. I think it will be an engaging and enlightening session. So I'll start with our first question and I will direct this toward Ms. Hodges, in a work environment where promotion is based on who you know and not what you know, what type of advice can you offer a young person who has proven to have skill sets and knowledge but is not socially accepted? First thing is you need to get involved. Um, building relationships. I think you should, when you enter into a company, you should always try to find a mentor. Um, that's somebody who can help you navigate through some of the unwritten rules in the workplace. But you need to get involved. If the company is having activities, um, because people will remember your name by uh, how much you participate, how you volunteer for projects, things like that it will help you establish who you are with leadership. Anyone else? I completely agree with everything she just said. So it's really, I don't want to say anything to piggyback off on. Um, just get to know the right people. Um, I know a lot 
lot of times we'll say, well, it's not about what you know, it's who you know. But at the same time, it falls back on what you know, because you can only know so many people. And then once it's time for you to go ahead and, you know, when the rubber hits the road and you don't know what you're talking about, it's not going to matter, right? So I totally agree with that with finding a mentor and getting to know the right people. But at the same time, um, develop your competency so that way once you know the right person, you can back it up with your knowledge of your discipline. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What advice would you give a new college graduate entering corporate America? And I'd like each one of you to kind of answer this one. And we'll start with Carlette. Okay. What advice do I give a new college graduate? Um, just know you're not going to, and I'm not trying to be discouraging, but just keeping it real as they say. Um, a lot of times we think, I know with my friends, when we graduated, and this is actually back in 2003, we thought that we were going to pretty much like ball out of control and have these, you know, have this fabulous office and drive these huge cars and we're gonna come back to homecoming, pushing the vans. No, I was still driving my old two Hyundai accent for like four years after that. So, and I had a rental car when I came from homecoming. So be, <laughs> I did. <laughs> so be realistic. Be realistic, um, be um, steadfast, be, be positive, stay focused. I, when I graduated from college, I didn't, I wasn't like some of my, my peers and I didn't have anything set up because I didn't, I didn't listen to what others were telling me. I did what I wanted to do and I did what I thought was best for me. And I ended up having three jobs. I worked at my sister's hair salon as a shampoo girl. I worked at a restaurant in Chicago called Leona's as a horrible waitress. And also I was working at a real estate company um, where I was interning with at the time. So just be focused and, and start setting goals. You know, just, just try to be as prepared as you can and just stay focused and just stay encouraged because it's gonna be difficult because you don't have any experience. And it's like, well, how do I get experience if I don't have a job and how am I gonna get a job? And it's like a cycle, but just start networking now and just, I would just really just stay encouraged. I would say the, uh, the fact that you're present today indicates that you're ready to enter into the uh, professional work environment, uh, meaning that you're here, meaning that you're making a sacrifice and you're committed to uh, bettering yourself. So that's the first thing. Second, I would say that uh, certainly need to have your priorities. Uh, don't need to wait until you graduate. You start setting those now. And then thirdly, I would say that know that you've earned the right to, uh, to participate in corporate America, you've been prepared. And regardless if people say you can't, just know that you certainly can. Okay, so I worked at a company called the Kellogg Company, which is corporate America, and we had a lot of young people coming in. And that was their first real experience into corporate America. And they were surprised because, you know, you sometimes you're a big fish on campus, right? And you walk into a corporation and you're ready, you're excited about the opportunity, uh, and students kind of, or the new employees kind of got lost along the way and discouraged. I think that it's important for you to understand that um, where you are in your career and, and uh, understand that you need to network and build opportunity. Come into an organization with an open mind. You're learning and every company is different. And no matter how smart you are and what you know, there's always something that you can learn. You're gonna encounter um, multiple folks in the workplace. They're gonna, people who've been there for 20 years, people who've been there for a year or two. And you're gonna be working with different teams and you gotta be open. Don't be afraid to share your ideas, but also be open to feedback. If people are telling you things, listen to what they have to tell you because that's how you're going to navigate through. And it's all about building relationships. Everything that you're going to do in corporate America is about building relationships. And it's important for you to be able to be a part of a team as well as work independently. But I think more so than anything at your stage, being able to be an active member of a team, being able to communicate, being able to take direction, that's going to help you become successful. Okay, uh, I'm going to take it a little, little different angle on it. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, we're saying entering into corporate America, I'm assuming that job is in place. Uh, the biggest transition that I know coming from college into working is you've come from having no money to making some money. Okay? My advice, save day one. 
start your 401k, start investments. Because one of the things you're gonna realize, as much as you're trying to make money now when you don't have any, there's gonna be a downside where you're ready to retire and get out of making money and have some sitting back for you, okay? That's a view we don't look at going into the job. That's a view we look at when we're coming out of the job and running out of time. So my first advice is start saving day one when you're not used to making a lot of money, take some of that off the top, put it to the side, invest it, 401k, get you a financial advisor, talk to somebody who knows about how to invest money. It may seem like you're giving away some of your money early, too early on, but if you never had it in the first place, you're not gonna miss it, okay? It's a lot harder to start doing that after the fact. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Now, we have heard advice for new college graduates entering corporate America. We have been given some advice about when you're not socially accepted, but you're in corporate America. Are there any questions from the audience at this point? Are there any questions? advice for new college students entering corporate America or what to do if you're in situations. Any questions from the audience? Okay, my question oh. <laughs> Well, my question is directed maybe towards the younger individuals in the room. Um, for the individuals that graduated from HBCU, how difficult was it to translate, I mean, transition into HBCU life, you know, caring, nurturing environment to corporate America? Okay, that's an excellent, excellent question. I graduated in 1982, accepted the job in a place called Rock Island, Illinois. Never been there before. Probably 90% uh, 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 employment was uh, uh, Caucasian. Uh, very few African Americans there. And so it was pretty difficult uh, to be candid with you because there were uh, many people that didn't want you there. Uh, there were a few that didn't mind you being there. Uh, and so you had to make up in your mind that you deserved to be there. And once you made your mind up that you deserve to be there, and you work hard, and you, you network, um, and each year, each day, it became much, much easier. So I'm a graduate of UPB, um, and I currently work as a, uh, I'm sorry, with a, my client is a power company. And it's, to be honest with you, it's just, it's all white men, okay? I don't say every last employee, but the majority of the individuals that's running the company are white men. And coming from an HBCU where obviously you look around and everyone pretty much looks like you to transition to a position where it's all white men that are running the show, um, it is a humbling experience because you have to um, be, I don't want to say it's a certain way that you have to act, but it is a certain way that you have to, it's, a, it's an adjustment. Okay, um, it's, it's a way that you need to um, approach situations because a lot of times you can be looked at as, you know, you don't want to be looked at as an angry black woman or, you know, the angry black man. You want to make sure that you maintain that professionalism. So I would definitely, if you can now, um, she mentioned about networking, you want to get your professional image together now because if you plan on going into corporate America, honestly, that's what you're going to deal with. Um, I noticed that a lot of the black women that do have corporate positions, most of them, um, or the ones that do have them, are in transactional positions, like in accounts payable, or accounts receivable, or in the mail room. But as you go higher up the floor, it gets lighter and lighter. And I'm not talking about the wall color, you understand? So just um, definitely start maybe reading, you know, maybe kind of doing some research um, to kind of see how other individuals dealt with it and, you know, ask questions, get a mentor. You know, we're here and, you know, we'll certainly help you the best way that we can. So I hope that makes sense. Before I ask the next question, I'd like to read some information that we received from a company about their personal appearance policy. 
And I'm skimming the article, but it starts off with, while current styles and individualism are not discouraged, extremes of any kind should be avoided because they reflect unfavorably on both the individual and the conservative image of the company. Personal appearance is expected to be professional and should not be an objective, and I'm sorry, an object of attention. If an employee reports to work improperly dressed or groomed, a manager may ask him or her to return home to change clothes and may take other appropriate corrective actions. Employees will not be paid for such time away from work and repeated violations will cause disciplinary actions. And then they go on to describe like what the requirements are. Uh, and this company were very, very specific. And I'll just give you certain examples. Females, dresses, skirts, and blouse combinations or suits must be worn. Dress pants should have creases. Conservative scarves and handbags are permiss permissible. Sleeveless blouses and dresses must be worn with a jacket at all times. Skirts and dresses must be no shorter than two inches above the knee. Fingernails should be a professional color and length. Earrings are limited to two pair per lower, lower lobe only. <laughs> Males, dress socks must be worn, dress slacks must be worn, coats and ties must be worn on all business calls. Hair lengths should be kept above the collar, sideburns, and mustaches should be neatly trimmed. Dress shirts and coordinating ties must be worn to the office. The following are not permitted, young men. Earrings, visible body piercing and tattoos. This company was very specific about what they require as far as dress goes and the disciplinary actions that they'll take, like this offense, a write-up, that offense, something else, and a third offense, released from your responsibilities for that company. So companies are getting really, really strict about appearance and dress and attire and what is proper attire for work. So I'd like for the panelists and any other consultants in the audience to answer and discuss this question. How are some of the African-American hairstyles and fashions received in corporate America? And we'll start with Kevin. Okay, um, I'll speak from the male perspective. Uh, I had a twist at one point, and I've, I've shared that in some of the classes uh, that I've been in. Uh, I did not have twists going into the job. Uh, how is it looked at? You don't always know, because you don't know who the person is that's making the decision on the other side of the table. Uh, there are different situations with different people, different companies, uh, but I've always been taught to err on the side of caution. And when I'm not in, I'm not a part of the establishment, I'm trying to become a part of the establishment, uh, it's, I'm accountable for myself, so it's incumbent upon me if I intend to get this job, get this position, get this promotion, whatever it is I'm trying to do, uh, then I need to assemble it. I need to conform to what the requirements are there or what the expected requirements are there. Uh, once I've accomplished that task, then I've got some leeway after I've proven myself, uh, established that I'm an asset to the company that I'm, that I'm particularly speaking of, uh, then I've got some things I can do, which is why I have an earring right now because I can. I put my 16 years in at AT&T and proven myself to be an asset, uh, which is why I can wear the jewelry I wear now. Would I tell another student to do that now? Definitely not. To tell them to do that when they receive the same things that I have, 
that will be up to you and how you feel about your position at your job and how you are you know, received. You have to look around and check your environment. And like she said, environments are different. That particular company was very specific. Uh, there's no leeway there. The rules are there. Uh, you break the rules, then you put yourself in a position to have to deal with the consequences of it. We talk a lot about appearances in the classes and everything. And the first thing that I tell students is when you're applying for jobs, you need to do some research on the company. A company like that, if you go to their website, you're gonna kinda of get a feel for what their culture is like. It's gonna be evident in reading about their history, their mission, uh, and all that information. So that will then, if you decide to proceed with that, be prepared to adhere to those guidelines. Um, with, when it comes to the hair, you know, corporate America is changing, culture is changing, and, but the people who are still in charge are folks who made these rules years ago. And it's changing slowly. And, and perception has changed a lot over the years, but everybody may not be ready. It's not that you have to give up who you are or your style, but you gotta make a choice as to what's important for you at that moment. If you want that job, and you need to be prepared then to make any sacrifices you may have to with your hair. And like Kevin said, once you get in, you don't wanna have anything that's gonna distract people from really knowing who you are and the talent that you're bringing to the organization. If they can't get past your hair or the, the piercings or the tattoos, they'll never get to realize who you are and you'll never get to be your whole self and bring all of you to that job. Uh, performance is, is very, very important, uh, but also image is critically important. So that's really what the person deals with, and that is your individual image. Uh, I've been in management for 15 years. I've been a selected supervisor for 15 years, and I will tell you that uh, normally you will never see anything on the uh, interview questions in terms of a person's appearance. However, there is something called the unwritten rule. And that is, the unwritten rule says that you really don't want to uh, present yourself in a way that would distract from who you are, distract from what you're trying to accomplish. So you have to weigh those factors out. Uh, you know, you can be yourself, however, you don't want to distract from what you're trying to accomplish uh, as you uh, pursue your professional career. <laughs> um, it's just funny, and I'm not trying not to be like the rebellious one, but it's just so funny when I hear like African American hairstyles, or you know, a certain way that African American African American wear their hair. I don't, I never got that. I, I never, I've never agreed with it. Um, because I feel like, and again, this is opinion based. This is Carla's opinion, not the Bible. You have three other other individuals that you can certainly. Um, listen to, but you can hear me. Um, but in my opinion, it does depend on the culture of the environment. Um, I work again in corporate America where on different levels, like the IT group, um, they're very, I won't call them weird, but they're a very unique group of people. Okay, very unique group of people. Um, the way they dress, like this one guy, very you know, long hair, he wears combat boots, but he's, he's never in front of the client. But I work with my client every day. But you know, does that change my work ethic or does that change who I am or, or does that change the fact that um, I'm a good worker, have a good work ethic because I decide I want to go natural and grow dreads. So it's almost difficult for me to answer this question because it just truly depends. So I don't want you guys to go to get so caught up in one, well, I'm who I am. I had a perfect example. I have a family member that for the longest time didn't want to cut his hair, didn't want to cut his hair, didn't want to cut his hair. Until he saw that the fact that he had grades, no, no hits, no hits, no hits. So I don't want to cut my hair, I don't want to cut my hair. But you need a job. Eventually he cut his hair. Now I'm not saying because he cut his hair that that's why he is working now. But I do think that they have a little, a little, little something to do with it. Um, and don't feel that you are losing yourself because you may have to alter your look. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to get money. That's Bottom fine. line, point blank, period. So that, that's Any other comments on that from any other consultants, 
any experience that any other consultant would like to share about experiences with hairstyles or fashions in the workplace. Oh. Good evening. My name is Ronnie Bryce, and I'm Assistant Vice President uh, Administration of Finance at Kansas State University. Now, excuse me, when they said get in blue jeans go get comfortable, I got comfortable. It's okay. It's okay. okay. It's all right. Okay. Uh, all right. Ideal in a educational setting. Uh, the individuals that work with my department normally half of them wear a uniform, half of them are in blue jeans, half of them are in suit tie. Now the reason for this is we have to deal with some guys deciding that they want to go and get some body heat. Well, that created a problem because when you're in the law enforcement profession, unless you're working undercover, narcotics, or trying to work in with a particular background or group of people that you're working with, can you imagine having a president with an officer in his office taking a report and he's got more body ink than the paper he's writing on. So what we had to do, we actually had to implement a policy for dealing with body ink and body piercing. And luckily, nobody has any piercing because in Kansas, you might realize it gets hot in the summertime. We have black uniforms. But because you went out and got a lot of ink, you got to wear long sleeve shirts all year round because you can't be exposed or be exposed to the public what you done went out and done. Now, luckily, we don't have anybody with the braids or anything on that line. But the appearance that you bring upon the university is a reflection of the president and the vice president. So sometimes they have a problem with what they have to see. Now, when I say that some of my staff in Blue Jean, it depends on the job duty that they're assigned to. Like if you're uh, dealing with the hazardous waste, well, you don't need to be in a suit and tie. You need to be as comfortable as you can. Or if you're a computer person, you don't have to deal with anybody because you're sitting in a cubicle. So we really don't too much care how you look. But if you're an investigator working on a sexual assault or robbery or theft, we want you looking suit and tie or shirt and tie. So it just all depends on which area within that organization that you fit in would depend on your parents. Thank you. I'm Wanda Bynum Ashley, and I currently work for the Arkansas State Highway and Transportation Department. I previously worked for the Arkansas Gazette newspaper, which was a Gannett owned company. Um, but this decision had nothing to do with Gannett. We were in the process of selecting a new customer service manager. The best qualified applicant was an African-American female who had braids. On paper, she was the best qualified applicant. I presented her to my manager and she said, Wanda, we cannot promote her. She has braids. She was denied that opportunity, but we never were able to say to her, you were not selected because of the braids. She never knew what happened. So I always have a concern about students uh, wanting to show their ethnicity with braids because sometimes it might cost you and no one will ever tell you that's why you were not selected. It does vary from company to company. So that's not something that, it's not always something you would know on the front end. So I always encourage conservative hairdos until you get in, like Kevin said, and get a chance to get a feel for what that environment is like. But well, can you, I guess, expand on that? We can just, what is a, um, what would be a conservative hairdo? Like, what constitutes, is it because you have black hair? Is it because you have weave that's straight down? Is it because you have short hair? Is it because it's straight? Does, I right. think when we're showing the ethnic styles is when it becomes a problem. In that particular case, it was braids. For me, I, I think about when women have all the different hairstyles. Again, you got to understand the company culture that you're going into. 
I think that if you have some braids and stuff, I, just make sure that they're neat. Right. You know, make sure that, they, that, you know, you can do a lot of stuff with the style. Again, it's all about when you walk into the organization. They want to know that they can envision you representing their organization. Don't let your hairstyle be the thing that overpowers them from finding out or seeing who you are. It's always about not being too distracted, whether it's from your hair or your jewelry, the clothes that you have on. You get one chance to have this interview and you have to present your best self. And you don't want to have anything that's going to be distracting and taking away from what you're bringing to the table. So. Right now, I think people are kind of getting used to some of the stuff that we're doing from an ethnicity standpoint. Just make sure it's neat. I think, Camille, I'm the lowest followers, and I'm the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at Christus Health. And I think Camille kind of shared a lot about what I was going to actually say. You have to research the company. And I do agree that, you know, there are things that can, uh -oh. there are there are some hairstyles that may overpower. Uh, once you walk in the room, I was sharing in the classroom, don't let anything that you wear, your hair, your jewelry, and so forth, enter the room before you get there. And so, you know, that's my tip because I had locks for seven years and I got my vice president job with locks. And I intentionally wore my hair down because I wore my hair up a lot. But I intentionally, when I went for the interview, I wore my hair down so that they would know that I had locks in my hair and it wasn't just braids because sometimes you can look at locks and they may look like braids because of lack of understanding. Um, I cut my hair off and had my hair natural before natural was even in stock. I still was promoted but it was because I did a good job as well. And I wasn't always the vice president of diversity and inclusion. I think that we have to be conservative in certain ways. I think it's all about grooming. Grooming has a lot to do with how receptive people are of you. I did wear my hair up because I knew that that looked more professional. I did wear my, I didn't have a lot of color in my hair because I knew that could be distracting. So there's certain things you can do in order to look appropriately. I know that when you wear braids, you curl your braids and you put it in, and sometimes you never know that it is braids. But ask somebody. We don't ask people how we look anymore. We just think we're doing our thing, and we look okay. Ask somebody, how do I look? I used to do that. Now my husband would say you look good because he knows it's the right thing to say. <laughs> but I would ask people when I went through the ugly look with the you know growing locks. I knew it was the ugly look with the little bitty locks. I knew that, so I would really make sure it was laying down all in place as I presented myself. It's a difficult task. Because we have to deal with those things. Think about it. You have to deal with those things because of who you are as African American. So you have to make the decision, how much am I, am I willing to give up? And when I sat in the lobby of the Kellogg Company, and I saw the people coming down when I first started working at Kellogg, I sat in the lobby and I watched them come up and down the escalator. And I was watching their appearance because I wanted to be at Kellogg. I definitely wanted to be at Kellogg. And I knew I was going to have to give up a little of the lowest followers to fit into that culture. And I did. I know I did. But then there became a point in my life, because I can do that, I decided that I was going to be the whole of the lowest, and I cut all my hair off, and I grew my hair natural. But that was the decision that I made, and I could do it at that time in that culture, in that environment, because things had evolved. So you have to, and I have to reiterate, you have to assess the culture that you're going into. And you have to determine how much I'm willing to give up of myself and how much money I might be leaving on the table if I do that. Ms. Hodge mentioned first impressions. She mentioned you kind of get one shot at a first impression. So here's a question associated with that. In your career, what is your general opinion of recent graduates entering the workforce for the first time? I'm sorry. There is a saying that a first impression is a lasting impression. Is it possible for a person to recover from their mistakes? How difficult is it? And if recovery is possible, 
what recommendations do you have? And we'll start with Ms. Hodge, but either of the panelists can attack this. So. Well, let me tell you, sometimes in corporations, the mistake you make and follow you for a long, long time. And that's going to be the reputation. That's what people may remember. But if you want to recover from making a mistake, I think the first thing you have to do is learn from the mistake that you made and get over it. Don't always apologize and keep bringing it up. Move forward. I think that if you learn from that mistake and you plan accordingly, you prepare yourself the next time, prove what you are worth and what you have to bring to the table. If you harbor on your failures, that's all people are going to remember you about. Be the shining star that you are. You know, figure out what you did wrong and figure out how you can do it better the next time. Again, get feedback and be open to the feedback. You know, um, I think the, the best thing you can do is when you make that mistake, ask somebody, you know, specifically, help me understand where did I go wrong with that? And, but be open to what they tell you and have ownership to that and learn from it and move forward. Very good question. I think we all would agree that first impression is important. I think the truth is, uh, when you first saw me, you were making an impression. Uh, when I saw you come in, I was making an impression of you as well. So first, first impression is always an ongoing process. Uh, can you recover from bad impressions? Absolutely. Uh, it's a matter of uh, understanding that the process is, is ongoing. Uh, understanding that your, uh, your image is very, very important. That it's ongoing, it's not uh, today. It's, uh, it's a life journey. And so as we journey, we do make uh, some errors. But the most important thing is to realize that you can recover from it. How do you recover? By understanding, first of all, that I made a mistake or an error. And then I make uh, some course adjustments to get myself back on track. So yes, uh, we can recover. Best way to do it is to understand that I've uh, gotten off track and then seek to get back on track. Because uh, corporate America is, is patient. Uh, there are great rewards there, but there are also consequences as well. Only thing I'll add to that, I agree with both of them. Only thing I'll add to that is just to admit to your mistake. Admit it. You know, we're human, right? Um, you know, we fall, we trip. I know I do. And I think once you admit it, hey, I know that I made a mistake. Once you've admitted it, again, you don't have to keep apologizing for it. I did it. And you don't have to say, well, I'm going to do all this to make up for it. Just do it. And like she said, get over it. So the only thing I'm going to add to that is just admit it. Someone uh, earlier tonight mentioned uh, about the fact that um, a young lady was denied a promotion but was not able to be told why. Uh, the question I have for the panel or any other professional in the room, what are some common pitfalls that, um, that potential employees often fall under but will never know the real reason why or uh, just subtle things that don't really pop out but make a big difference in the end? Okay, um, in some of the recruiting trips that I've done, uh, and I definitely haven't done as, as many as some of my, my panelists up here as well, but um, one of the big things that I saw uh, is being one of the number. Um, if you're wanting to work for at and if you're wanting to interview with me to get a job at at and I don't want to be the fifth, sixth, seventh company that you came to. You had a stack of resumes and you just went one to the other. Uh, you weren't really looking for me. If AT&T isn't on your cover letter, I'm just on that stack, I'm on a big distribution list, I'm not gonna take you any more seriously than you're taking me, okay? If you haven't personalized what's going on. So when you're out here looking for these jobs and you're going to look at a lot of different companies, they don't have to know that you're looking at a lot of different companies. You want to personalize all of your inquiries, uh, any type of documentation to send it back forth, emails, letters, whatever your conversations are, personalize it. She mentioned earlier that you can go online and look up information and research your companies. Know who it is you're talking to, you know something about the background. Make me think that you're interested in me specifically and that I'd be better off having you. Uh, that common problem is making it very general. And then I know it's a form letter. 
and I'm going to treat you like it's a form letter. I've been talking today a lot about building your brand. Your brand starts when you're interviewing with the company. The first thing when you come in, you, need to, you really need to know and, and have confidence in the skills that you're bringing to the table. I would tell people the best thing to, is be prepared for the interview. And by doing that is when you're applying for a job, I always tell people, print that job description out. Right? Print the job description out, put your resume down beside it, and highlight it and compare all the attributes of what they're looking for in their resume, look at uh, in that job description, look at your resume and make sure your resume reads to it, but then be prepared to sell yourself to somebody. When, it, when you're walking into an interview, I tell folks you have 30 seconds to really engage me enough to know how I'm going to take you, if I'm going to take you serious or not in an interview. Don't waste my time. When you come, if you're not prepared, the pitfalls is, be aware of those micro messages that you send to. I was sharing with somebody uh, an interview that I just had. I'm trying to find somebody to do some work for me. And I set up a meeting. I met them first. Skill set is great. Take them in to meet the EVP of Business Affairs who we do going to be doing some work with. And if you can read people, you know sarcasm. And he's sitting there and he's saying, so tell me about why do we do this supplier diversity thing? And I was like, oh, Lord, no. She did the, what? You know, and she didn't realize she did it, but she did the sister girl head snap. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, and I'm thinking, Lord, please don't let words come out of her mouth that she can't take back. You know, because I'm sitting there, I'm wanting her. I mean, I was fighting for her as a candidate. And so then the next thing you know, she, he, she answers the question, and he asks her another question. And she did it again. And she didn't realize she was doing it until she had done it. But you got one opportunity, really, when you're in interviews, to present yourself. And you know what they said about her after the meeting? Is that they didn't think that she would have the ability to manage up. Because she was working with the second person in command in that interview. And he was kind of offended because he was just joking with her. And he thought that, OK, if that's how she's going to handle with business with me, how can we expect her to handle business with vendors and other members of our leadership team? So I think you need to be aware of the messages that you're sending when you're, when you're speaking to people. But be prepared. Sell yourself. Not what the company can do for you, but how can you be a value add to that organization? Just to say, um, when you sell yourself, so you're selling yourself, right? And the way I look at it, people buy from who they like. And obviously, a, a lot depends on I know I don't want to work with someone that I don't like, regardless if they have all the skills in the world. If I don't like you, and I don't like your personality, and I know we have to work together 40 to 60 hours a week, I just don't think our personalities are going to match up. So I'm not saying don't you dare change who you are, your personality. Always be you. But the question I know you were asking was, what are some things when you don't know the reason why? I worked in staffing for three and a half years, where um, you know I would give feedback from hiring managers all the time. And 50, it was like a survey, 57% of it was personality based. Um, and if you don't fit in with that, with the culture of the company, that has been, to me, what I've seen, has been one of the main reasons why. And specifically for that young lady, hey, they don't want the bad girl maybe at, you know, downstairs somewhere, but not at that level. So, um, you've been you've attended YMTF, yes. What have we been talking about? The laws. Those are those soft skills that we've been talking about. She just said attitude. She just said speaking. That's exactly the thing that we are talking about that gets in the way. When we are talking behind people's backs and saying that kind of stuff, it was appearance. It was speaking. It was attitude. So Ms. Cherry was genius in, in creating these laws because those are those soft skills that you really need to pay attention to. And listening to, you know, what the culture is and what that is, that's really going to give you a leg up. I just hired somebody mm -hmm. December, and she was so dressed, really nice. And, you know, her uniform, I mean, her, her suit or whatever came in, really professional. And Friday, she had on tennis shoes and jeans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I was like, oh, Lord. And so she's already hired. She's already there. And I'm like, what am I going to do? So as a manager, 
I'm coaching her and I'm giving her tips and ideas about what she should do and she should be. And I just started talking about dressing for the job that you want and not the job that you have. And we were just mentioning these things. Next week, I didn't see those tennis shoes anymore. So she could have taken that role that, you know, you know, or she could have been like, and lost. You know, the job where we, we could have replaced her easily. But she listened. And she changed her appearance. And she's also changing her speaking and her writing. And that's just it. So pay attention to what we're saying. And pay attention to this because though that has really contributed to your life. Good evening, I'm Beyonce Stanley, I'm a graduating senior at the University majoring in accounting. And my question is regarding uh, recent graduates, and I'll be one basically in May, um, still trying to get into corporate America. What are some of the, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure you want to come to corporate America? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but what are some, as far as for the job that you basically would consider your dream job, um, when you're applying for it, and like if you have the opportunity to do the um, interview with them, what are just some of the tips on, you know, being able to sell yourself above and beyond the average that comes into that, you know, maybe that same interview? How to sell yourself or make yourself stand out in the interview? Uh, very good question. Sound like you're very confident in terms of what your uh, pursuits and goals and ambitions are. So I think that's the first step, uh, having confidence and sound like you have that. And then basically being able to actually go in and look the manager and or panel who's making the selection uh, in the eye, uh, in the eye, to confess them that you're the best person uh, for the job, not only on paper, but you're the best person for the job that can bring the skills required to perform and exceed in that particular area. And I think that's the most important thing. Well, I've always been a different kind of person. Uh, when I've applied for jobs, I can tell you a couple times, you know, you gotta think about when you get to the interview, how many people are at that level? And how can you distinguish yourself from somebody else? So what I say is be prepared. The most important thing that you do is be prepared for the interview. Remember what I said, you're building your brain from that moment on. If you are hired at that moment, that's the beginning of who you want them to see you as and the potential you have to bring to the organization. So when you come to the interview, some, some things that I've done differently is when they ask you to bring your resume, I may prepare a little packet that I want to leave for them just so they can kind of get a, a little bit more information about my background. But I'm selling myself as to why I am the most important and, and the right candidate for that job. Everything that I speak to in my interview is geared to how my skills apply to the job that I am applying for. That way no one has any questions when I leave the room that I can do that job. And you try to set yourself apart from other people because you think about, they may have four or five people that they're interviewing. What makes you different? And I think it's the passion that you bring with the job. If it's something that you really, really want to do, show your passion for that work and, and, and understand, like I said, be prepared to, to every little job that you had or every book that you, you studied. How do those skills apply to this job and sell yourself? I think there's two different ways of looking at this. Um, there's that initial job, the very first one, and then there's that second job after you're in a job and you're making a lateral movement or trying to get a promotion within. And uh, two things you want to look at that. Uh, with that initial job, I think she hit the nail on the head on a previous question. She said, do the research. Uh, go out there and get your resume and lay it next to what you're seeing online about that company. Uh, before you get to that interview is the preparation. By doing that, you see the buzzwords and where that company is going. Make sure those buzzwords show up in your paperwork. Your paperwork is there before you are, okay? They see that resume before they see you. And that, that's something that says, okay, they actually researched us. Here's a word that we use in, in our corporate you know, header or whatever it is. Uh, if I see that, you know already that aligns with what we're trying to do as a company. And the, the second part of it, it goes along with that, um, I know for a fact that with AT&T, the people that do the hiring aren't necessarily the people that are managing the job. 
okay? The HR department's handling that. They get the resumes based on profiles that we provide to them, okay? Which means there are certain words they're looking for in resumes, certain skill sets that they're looking for, and they're filtering on that before you're getting the opportunity to have that interview with the person who's doing the hiring. Okay, so by doing that that research part, you're making sure those buzzwords are in. But if you're already in, in that first job, you're looking for that second one, you do the follow-up. After you do that, find out who the hiring manager is, go meet them. Go introduce yourself, because you've got that inside scoop from that point. This is, like I said, after the first job, after you're inside with them. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna share a little story with you too, because you know, some people will put those buzzwords in, and that's how you get your resume noticed. But you better be prepared to speak to the buzzwords. I had a guy, who, and this is, I'm trying to find somebody who worked for me. And I had a young guy who presented himself on paper. He was, I mean, it was good. His energy level was high. And then I took a minute to tell him about the job and all the stuff that I needed him to do for me. And I gave him the real deal. And his eyes was like a deer in the headlights, got big. And I said, what's wrong? And I said, he says, I'm excited. I said, well, well, I said, you got, you got some, um, are you concerned, you got problems? No, no, I got a lot of ideas. And I said, well, share some of them with me. Now, here's your opportunity to sell me that you're the best candidate for that job. And he couldn't articulate one idea, okay? So what happened with him? He's gone. So, so do your research. Make sure you can speak to your skills and how you are you know, you can apply the skills to that job. Don't go in for a fake it because there's ways to find out. Because we know if you know this job or not. But sell it. I keep telling you to sell yourself. That's what the interview process is all about. Be prepared, do your research, and be able to articulate what your skills that you have and how they apply to that job. Use those buzzwords because that definitely going to get your resume there and recognized. But not only do use them, but be, do your homework. Don't wait to the day before to kind of figure out what you're going to say in the interview. You know you got an interview coming up. Prepare. Test it out. Find somebody. Do the research online to kind of find out what other companies are doing in the industry. Be prepared to let them know that you are interested in that company and you have a lot to offer. All of that can be done with career services, by the way. We have to make sure, make sure you get that buzzword in. Career services office here called Will Hall. If you're not sure about it, go with it. They'll take care of you, all right? Good commercial, Kevin. One more question from the audience, and then I'd like to move in a different direction. Okay. Okay. I have a question regarding resumes. Um, I know a career service we only have to have one sheet of resume. If I do anything else, I would end up with three sheets of resume. How would you know what to give to somebody when you're looking for a job and what to take away off my resume? Because I've dabbled in everything, as you know. But I just don't like trying to get internships and stuff outside of career services and they ask my resume. I don't know how much it's okay to send them because I don't want to overpower them with everything that I do. <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's important. Yeah, I think it's important for young college students to have a resume. I, I think you maybe need to have two resumes. There's a resume that you have that you're presenting to the organization that kind of get in the door kind of thing, and that's what maybe the one pager the career services is having you guys do. Make sure you have you have some relevant experience for getting jobs, internships. Make sure that's on that resume. And if you give them the opportunity to go into the company to meet with them, you may want to, like I tell you, leave them a little something a little extra. Have more of a detailed resume to share with them the details of your experience. But don't put down just mess to make it, you know, the, make sure it's relevant information on that resume. Just don't be talking because it sounds like it's good or whatever. Be, get some bullet points and the details specifically as to what that position you had, the skills you have, and how it relates to the job you're applying for. Uh, but someone mentioned, like, we mentioned expectations, we mentioned being prepared. Kevin even mentioned um, that we come for two different types of interviews, like one if you are trying to get into the company, and another if you have a job, but you're trying to go after something else. And this question deals with, for the panelists, as a manager or as a staffing manager, what do you expect from a college graduate, someone brand new, right off of UAPB's campus, entering the workplace, 
What because you can't expect them to have all of these experiences. You cannot expect them to know, you know, if you're a programmer, what the company wants you to program, how you want. So what do you expect from them? Just new, as my grandmother used to say, right off the chicken truck. <laughs> Um, I would think um, you should be excited, um, have lots of energy, um, ask questions. You know, you want to always show improvement. Be enthusiastic. You know, you, you are you happy job? So now, it's, you know, I would suggest that you begin to ask questions and immediately start to contribute. You know, what can I do? This is my idea. You know, who needs help? You know, always be, always try to be as involved as possible because obviously you don't have, you, you have skills but you don't know the job just yet. So you want to do whatever you can to begin to master your discipline and master that position. So I would just say, try to be as involved as possible, ask as many questions as possible, and just immediately begin to contribute. As a UAPB graduate myself, uh, being a manager now, I would expect you, being that you are a UAPB graduate, uh, to come into the work environment well prepared because you're well able. This university has given you a great education, allowed you to interact with very knowledgeable people, and so we expect you to come in uh, excited, uh, willing to learn, uh, willing to interact with uh, with your peers, with your coworkers, and have a great desire to make significant contributions uh, to that company. Really quick. Really quick. Listening, obviously we're talking about laws. Uh, when I mentioned that to contribute quickly, I don't want you guys to get so excited that you're just doing some stuff and now it's not what your manager wanted, but you were so excited to contribute and now what you gave them is totally opposite of what they were asking for. So make sure that you totally clarify with your manager or your team what it is that they do need and want and based off that information, is what you can provide he or she so just make sure that you listen if I'm hiring a new college student, I'm hiring you because I see potential in you. So the job that you have, I'm looking for you to come in and be willing to learn, ask a lot of questions, be able to accept the feedback. Uh, a lot of times we get into an organization, I know the young people are ready to perform and I'm gun ho and I can do this and you're confident. And yeah, you probably are, you probably can do. But you gotta understand that there's a time and a place for everything. And I want you to know, if I'm hiring you in an organization, I'm gonna groom you, and I'm gonna, gonna recognize, I'm identifying where your strengths are. I don't tell people that you have weaknesses. We talked about that earlier. You have areas of opportunity. And you should know where your areas of opportunities are. And you should also know and have an idea of where you wanna go. Right? And as your manager, I'm going to work with you to try to help you develop and grow to help you, you know, obtain your goals as well. But I'm not expecting you to know everything, but I'm expecting you to be open to learn. I expect you to be open-minded, I expect you to be willing, and I expect you to be timely. I think that's about all I'm going to expect day one. Uh, but I'm going to demand all three. <laughs> Any other consultant I want to add to that? Expectations that you may have for a new college grad intern. So, I'm not going to answer that question. I want to have a privilege to go back to the previous question because I want to leave a tip. When, uh, and it's around the area that I think someone talked about making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, and potentially failing because I think we all make mistakes. And this is, I guess this is in alignment with expectations. A little tip for you as students going into the workplace and any adult in the room who are trying to remove that negative impression that your boss or someone may have on about you. So the Lois Bowers bombed putting her budget together. And so the impression that my boss may have about Lois Bowers and the way she put a budget together is that she can't do a budget well. And what I would suggest that Lois Bowers do, not only learn how to do a better budget, but how do I repeat that I have done it extremely well over and over again? So I may have a meeting with Camille Hodges and I say, you know what Camille, you and I had a budget meeting and I did that budget to the T. 
Camille is going to say to my boss the next time, you know, Lois and I had a meeting and she did that budget extremely well. When I see my boss the next time, I'm going to say, you know what, Mary, Camille and I did the budget together. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what you want to remove from their mouth is that Valois did the budget terribly, but she didn't do it well, and put in their mouth that Valois did the budget well. I say that because I read an article, and it is about repeating things. So whenever you are doing something that you have not done well, and you master it, because you got to master it first before you can say you've done well. And I've done this because I've had errors. But if I don't repeat it that I've done it, not just myself, but if someone else doesn't repeat it, that negative thought stays in their mind, particularly if you did something terrible. If you did something good, they're going to always say, well, the Lord knows how to do the budget extremely well. But if you do something wrong, it lasts a long time. It's hard to forget that one item. You may have done a whole lot of other things well, but it's hard to forget that one item. So you got to get someone else to repeat it other than yourself. You understand what I'm saying? And I wanted to leave you with that because I've tested it. I've tested it recently. And it, it's amazing how when you get someone else to repeat that you're doing something well, how it sticks into, especially someone credible, it sticks in your boss's mind or if you've had to deal with someone else, a client or a customer, get someone else to repeat that you've done it well. I just want to leave that tip. Thank you for those comments, for Lewis, because it leads us to one other question that was prepared for the panelists. Um, because she said, um, get someone else to understand that you do something well. Get someone else to speak for you, to vouch for you, to be your advocate when you're not around. So the question for the panelists is how important are peer-to-peer -peer relationships with students, peer-to-peer, -peer, faculty, first employers, peers on the job, how important are those peer-to-peer -peer relationships? Okay, okay so we, we have, uh, I've worked in an organization where there was a young professionals group and that was one of the biggest things that they did was provide mentoring for each other. When you're first entering into the workplace, you don't know all the unwritten rules and there's some things you don't know about business etiquette, right? So peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is very, very important uh, for you, as well as uh, think about opportunities and things like say for instance, there be, could be somebody your age who's been there a little longer, who may already moved up to a different level and can help you navigate through your career and give you pointers on communication style of the organization. Uh, developing those relationships are very critical. And I think that's one of the most important things you need to do. Now watch out for the folks who are, because everybody in the organization is not good mentors, okay? You got to be able to discern what information you're going to keep and what information you're going to let filter through. Because everybody, I'm going to tell you this, everybody ain't working out for your best interest. And I said ain't, because I'm from Tennessee. But everybody that you work with is not going to have your best interest at heart. And you need to understand that sometimes rules apply to other people that may not be applicable to you. And so, you know, it's important for you to kind of find some people who can help you navigate through an organization. And sometimes it feels safer talking to somebody who's similar to you because you just sometimes, you know, people don't want to go to their managers because they think that if I talk to my manager about this, they don't think I'm competent and I can't do my job. But if you can find somebody credible, look out for what their reputation is in the organization. When you're trying to find a peer mentor, Find out what other people think about them. Ask the manager, you know, I was talking to so-and-so, so-and-so, and see how, what regard their name has held up in, in the organization. Associate yourself with positive people. That's what you're trying to find out. Just because you got somebody working next to you and they've been there for a while, if they don't have a good reputation, they are not a good mentor for you. And you need to seek out people who are on a, the, what they call a fast track. Find out what they're doing. Get information from them that will help you also get on that track. I would certainly agree with all that has been said. Uh, in addition to that, I would say that what I have found to be true is that there's always someone that maybe you don't know 
that's looking to help you. And so if you continue to just kind of stay focused, uh, keep doing your job well, improve your uh, interpersonal skills, uh, your communication skills, and kind of working with your peers uh, in terms of sponsorship, because that's really what it's going to take to get you from where you want to be uh, to where you are pursuing uh, sponsorship. And someone is always interested in sponsoring you, but you have to make yourself available. I would just say, um, don't disregard someone because of their title. A lot of times we get wrapped up in titles, so that's the executive director, that's the VP of cabinet. Um, titles, yes, they do mean something, but when you get so wrapped up in it, um, I actually went to go see uh, the security guard at our um, building, by the power company, they have security like crazy. He actually invited me to see him and his band play on Friday. It's just like, oh, David, I don't know you played the band. And, uh, you know, we were just speaking about how he was saying how so many people come in every day. You know, you see this guy every day and know it. And so many people don't speak to him. I speak to everybody. I don't care. But he was just saying how people are so snobby. And I'm not saying that you have to speak to everyone, but say if they needed a favor to get into the building one night. Um, they might have left their purse or their wedding ring or something of value. If I was him, I wouldn't let him in the building. You know what I mean? Um, just because you don't know me when you walk in every day, you've worked here for the last seven years. But yet, for me, I'm sure you would let me in if I needed to come in and get something of value. And I say that to say, for the person that mops the floor, that cleans the bathroom, okay, all the way up to an executive vice president, don't get wrapped up in titles. I know for me specifically, uh, peer to peer relationships are important because that's where my money comes from. Okay, uh, make no mistake, you're going to be judged on your performance, but a lot of my money is tied into the performance of other people. So uh, my peer-to-peer -peer relationships are very important to me. Uh, I need to get along with the people I'm working with. I need to care about their performance, because if they're not doing what they need to do, my money is impacted. I don't want my money impacted. So uh, the peer-to-peer -peer thing is very, very important. Build those relationships, build those trusts, and people tend to work better with you. Which I think uh, it was Colette that said, when they like you, make sure, try to make them like you. Do those things. I have my wife make brownies for my peers. <laughs> I don't even like brownies. But I asked her to make them because I knew what that would do for me. And it has helped me. It's made my job a lot easier. Uh, I'm, I'm here on my own, on my own volition. I took vacation days. My peers are covering a lot of things for me. Because we're cool. They trust me, I trust them, I would do the same thing for them. And those relationships are going to make sure that my bonus in March is going to be all right. So, <laughs> so really, really quick, so I'm not a brownie, like I'm not making <laughs> at all. But that's good, Kevin. It's really good. Um, what I was going to say is you want to make sure that uh, it's so funny, one of my good friends I graduated college with, he calls me a company woman, you know, you're a company woman. Yes, I am. I have rent that's due from the first <coughs> to the fifth every month. So at the end of the day, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer relationships, you always want to make sure that you make the best decision for the business. So yes, it is important that people like you, but sometimes people won't always like you, but as long as they respect you, and as long as at the end of the day, the, the common goal is to make the company money and to make a, the better decision for the company, that should always be in your mind. Now whether, not so much of, well, I want her to like me, I want her to like me, but that's not the best decision for the company. Does that make sense? So just always keep that in your mind. At the end of the day, what is going to be the best decision for the company? That's it. My name is Carlton Brewer, a junior major in political science here at the University of Arkansas, Pamela. And my question is, it's probably the most left field question, but what's the most exciting thing you do on your day-to-day -day job? Going to lunch. <laughs> It's not something exciting in my job on a daily basis, and I, I could be conscious about that. But what I can say is the most exciting part of my job is planning to do this, planning to be a part of YMTL. I can honestly, hands down, no problem. This is the most exciting thing I do. Because I get to come back and talk about 
I'm taking resumes back and I'm gonna start handling new people again. I'm saying, hey, I'm back again. It's me. The, it's that time. They know I'm coming. They know I'm coming with a handful of resumes, and I'm trying to, you know, provide an opportunity for students here. But every once in a while, something will happen. When we talk about it, I get that email from from a student that I may not have remembered. There's something I did for something I said, something that actually meant something uh, to another student. And that touches me. That makes the whole year worthwhile for me. Uh, I had a student say something to me today. Really meant something to me, you know. And that validates everything that I do with my job. The fact that I'm doing my job well enough for UAPB to allow me to come and represent my job and, and talk to these, like, these valuable students. Uh, can't beat that. Well, I tell you, you're going to be at work more than you be doing any other thing in your life, and you better enjoy what you do. Uh, I can say I honestly love what I do. I have three, this job that I got now combines three things that I do, and I'm passionate about all of them. And that's what gets me up every day. The other thing is I get to watch. I have a, a young woman who works for me. And I mentioned her a couple times in the class, and she was the most underutilized resource in our department. And I'm watching her grow, and I'm watching her flourish. And I know that because I have helped her uh, gain confidence in importing her, I, I told my boss, I don't think she's going to be with me more than two more years. And it's not that she's going to gonna quit. I think that she's going to be, I'm going to have to promote her out somewhere because She's that talented, and to watch her be able to grow and see and know that I had a hand in that, that's exciting to me that I've had an impact on somebody else's life. Uh, the most important thing that uh, I feel good about every single day is the fact that as a manager, I've been a manager for 15 years, I've always believed that there are uh, many, many qualified African Americans, so my objective every day is to empower those individuals that work with me. And so what's gratifying to me every day is when I see uh, someone that I'm mentoring actually achieving their daily goal. And at the end of the day, that really makes me feel uh, quite good. I don't know if I want to answer that. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I like one of the lunch. Lunch is actually one of the most exciting meetings for me every day at 11.30 to 12.30. Um, but I am, I'm very big on relationships. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lover of people. Um, and I get to meet different individuals every day because I work with several different managers for such a large company. Um, so really that is the most exciting um, part of my job is just meeting and building those relationships. And you just be surprised about what you know about certain individuals. We have dealt with this question and this issue throughout yesterday and today and on the phone planning and we've, we've dealt with this but I think it's fitting to end with this I, I was given an article about a study that happened the latter part of last year about some of the needs that the workforce some of the skill needs that are missing or lacking in the workforce and I think our chancellor, interim chancellor, even mentioned some comments about what industry is saying locally. And so from this article, it talks of the things that are missing or lacking in the students, in the new graduate these days. It talks about work ethics, soft skills. How many of us heard those words in our sessions today? Uh, basic math and reading skills, lacking, missing, critical thinking skills. I even have a good friend and her husband who they make a living like selling these skills development packages and sessions to Harvard and Yale for their incoming freshman class because they're getting the best and the brightest academically but the young people are struggling with time management, remembering to get up on, t I mean, remembering to go to bed at night, you know, just all kinds of getting to class when they're supposed to get to class, um, once they get to class, speaking up, speaking out. So it's not just happening on HBCU campuses. I, from this article and from my experiences with friends, it's happening worldwide. 
So what I would ask panelists is in your careers, what is your general opinion of recent graduates entering the workforce for the first time in terms of listening, appearance, writing, and speaking? What are some good and bad examples? And then any advice that you would offer to better prepare this generation of college students, specifically the UAPB students that are before you? Let's see. Um, it's okay to ask, you know, why? Um, it seems like um, a lot of the students that have coming out or that, are, that have transitioned into um, the real world, per se, have like this self entitlement thing. No one owes, I mean, yes, you do deserve to be here, but no one owes you anything. So it's a difference between deserving and me owing you something. No one owes you anything, okay? It is your right to be there, but I don't owe it to you. And so it seems like what I found is that many new graduates, you know, feel like after two years, I'm gonna be promoted into like director, and then I'm gonna have a corner office, and I'll make six figures, and I'm gonna, that's not how it really goes. Maybe I don't, I don't know anyone that's had it made like that, but it just seems like more so like a, a self entitlement <coughs> type of situation. Um, not listening, just wanting to just, well, this is how I want it, this is how it's going to be, and not willing to work hard. You know, it's like just so it goes back to self type, self entitlement. I work a lot of hours, you know, because I know that I have to work hard if I want to make it to the next level. And it's also a generational gap. Like you have individuals that would stay at a job for 30 years, like one job, 30 years, one job, 40 years, and then they retire. Now, you know, and I'm guilty of it. I've had maybe four jobs since I graduated, but I know for this particular, I found my home and I'll probably just stay there for a little while. So. It's a self entitlement, not really wanting to work hard. After five o'clock, you know, once five o'clock hits, they're out the door. You have to sometimes work a little bit over, sometimes without getting paid, to show, hey, I'm working hard, I want this job, I'm excited about it. So don't get so caught up in what's owed to you versus what you actually deserve. Just adding to that, I would say, as a graduate of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, you are certainly prepared. Uh, to enter into the corporate world and to uh, achieve your goals and your objectives. But it's going to be incumbent upon you to enter with the right attitude, and that is that I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to show up on time, look my best, I'm going to communicate, I'm going to work hard, incorporate myself into this company. Uh, this company doesn't really owe me anything other than the opportunity. And then you, as, a, as an employee, has to put forth your very, very best. And in doing that, you can improve upon any areas in your life that you feel you might be lacking in. Do you guys have any, any idea what you're getting ready to walk into when you go into corporate America? Not yet, but you're going to learn. OK, understand that you're going to walk into an environment where there's typically now four generations in a workplace. And people have already preconceived notions about who you are. The millennials have a stereotype associated with them already. They're expecting you to be lazy. They're expecting you not to be on time. They're expecting you to want it all right now. That's what their expectation is. So you're kind of going into the world at a disadvantage. So just know that going in up front. So when you go into the workplace, I think what you have to do is go in with a positive attitude. Make sure that you're on time. You know, one thing uh, is the first time you use traffic as an excuse, maybe you're new to the area, okay. But everyday traffic ain't gonna be a good excuse for you. And after a while, it, I keep telling you to protect your brand. And after a while, your brand's gonna get damaged because you're not gonna be reliable, right? So make sure that you you know and understand the expectations of your manager. Have conversation with them. Ask for feedback sometime. You know, if you've been doing something, you haven't quite heard how well you're performing, ask them, hey, you know, I'm doing all this, just wanted to make sure I'm meeting your expectations. Is there anything else that I need to be doing differently? Those kinds of things. Ask for the feedback and be open to 
uh, criticism because if you seriously want to improve and know that those people are the folks in charge of your career, you're going to hear, you're going to listen to what they're saying, and you're going to make some course corrections. Um, on the positive end, what I see is, uh, is energy. I see a whole lot of energy. I see a whole lot of willingness uh, from this latest generation of students coming into the workplace. And that's a really good thing. Uh, on the negative end, uh, when we talk about the laws, it always comes down to me in the communication area, writing and speaking. Uh, that seems to be a really, really, really dangerous area that, that things aren't, aren't going well. And it's not just this generation. Let me, let me be real clear. Uh, Definitely my generation, some older than me. Writing and speaking is not really going well. Uh, the thing is to recognize if you have an issue with writing and speaking. Uh, I've said all day long, you have to wipe the mirror clean. Make sure you can see a, a good picture of yourself. And recognize, do I have an issue with my ability to communicate verbally? Do I have an issue with my uh, ability to communicate in writing, texting, emailing? All of those things. There are issues there. And if you're not sure about it, ask somebody. And then go do something about it. Don't just accept it. Try to do something about it to clear that up. I've been watching the time. It is 7.34. So we're a bit over our time. <laughs> I, had, I knew I had to admit it because Ms. Terry was going to let us know. No. <laughs> so let's give the panel a round of applause. Thank all of you for coming. Are there any final parting remarks from Ms. Terry, Ms. Knowlton? I want to take the time to appreciate the panelists for what they've done and what they've given. <laughs> I also want to take the time to appreciate and thank the students for what they do. Ms. Cherry hear me say it all the time, I absolutely love what I do. And I gave this testimony a few weeks ago, I was asked, if you could have your ideal job, what would that ideal job be? <clears throat> I used to say my ideal job was not to have one. <laughs> and to be able to sit home and still live a comfortable life. Now, I'm in my ideal job and what I love to do. So just being able to give to you all what I've gotten in the years that I've been in the workforce. A lot of the students that know me know that I worked for Walmart for 19 years. And I say that Walmart prepared me for the job that I do now. I would not trade it for the world. I love you guys, and I hope that you all continue to grow and prosper. Thank you. And we also want you all to put your hands together for the facilitator. Nobody wants to know about her. Ms. Melissa Kennedy, she did an excellent job. All right, thank you.